Hey there, kids. Welcome to my revised discussion of the combined gas law and ideal gas law. You know, there are few teachers as adept as Mr. Munger is about being able to do reasonably complicated math and somehow messing up or writing it on the board. Thanks to one of my students, and you know who you are, for catching that on my original version of this video. I wrote down a five as a three. If you're looking for just pure demonstration purposes, it really didn't make a difference, but if you were actually working through the math yourself, which I encourage you to do, it did. So here is, upon request, thankfully, a corrected version. So let's get into this. So combined gas law and ideal gas law are the two ways that we look at the behavior of gases this week here in March of uh, 2020. So what is the difference? The first is that the combined gas law is, is basically the, the gas law of change. We're looking at initial conditions, which are usually referenced as ones, versus the final conditions, which are twos. And we are looking at the possible changes in pressure, volume, or temperature. Sometimes all three can be changed, or sometimes only two are being changed. Combined gas law is what it actually says. It is a combination of actually three earlier derived gas laws from the 18th and 19th century. The first of these was Boyle's law, which basically, if we kind of take temperature out of the equations, um, was a pressure to volume relationship. It was an understanding that volume and pressure were inversely proportional. That means as pressure goes up on a, on a volume, the volume probably is contracting in size and getting smaller. Just squeeze a balloon. I think you can intuitively understand that. And on, on the flip side, if a volume of a gas expands, if we have no change in temperature or we aren't adding or taking away the gas, in, out of the balloon or anything else, whatever system you're looking at, the pressure is going to go down. It's probably the most intuitive of, our, of ours because we can physically manipulate it. Then we have Charles's Law, which is a volume to temperature relationship. We're assuming that pressure does not change. So imagine the P's coming out of the equations. This is, an, this is a direct proportion relationship. It's very linear. As a volume of a gas goes up, it's because the temperature went up, and then vice versa. But this is only true if we are looking at temperature in the Kelvin system of measurement. This is because the Kelvin system is a measurement of the kinetic energy of whatever you are analyzing. The Kelvin system was partially designed to try, designed to, try to understand gases because they behave so differently than liquids or solids. If you try doing this with Celsius, it just doesn't work. Conversely, Gay-Lussac's law takes volume out of the equation and assumes that it's fixed in size before and after our changes in pressure and temperature. And this is also a direct relationship. As temperature goes up and down, pressure does too at a very linear rate if you were graphing it. Once again, it has to be in Kelvin or this relationship breaks down in terms of its exact linearity. On the other hand, ideal gas law, at least in its, in its kind of home base form, is PV NRT. And notice there's no ones and twos here. In, in its standard form, we're not looking at change. We're just analyzing the dynamics of the, of the container of the gas from the terms of pressure, volume, and temperature, but also in moles, which is denoted by the letter N rather than M. Also making this equation work is the symbol called R. This is the ideal gas constant, and it's represented here as 8.31 joules per mole, or also is kilopascals, which is the form of pressure we're working with today. What this equation basically does is that it sets the relationship of pressure and volume to the number of moles in that gas at a specific temperature. And then the R is sort of this number that you throw in there to make both sides equal each other. It's a constant, and being a constant, this number does not change. Now, if we were looking at pressure and atmosphere, 
um, this constant would be different. It would be 0 0.082, but we're not working with that value this week. We're just going to stick with KPAs. So let's take a situation with a, a, a similar gas uh, that's being analyzed and notice how we look at it differently depending on the law involved. Let's start off with the ideal gas law. So in our example here, we have a 226 gram tank of ammonia and it's kept at 180 degrees kil kilopascals of pressure and 260 Kelvin of temperature. What would the volume be in this case? So as always, do try to make that, that table list of your values. It's so critical for really not making mistakes like Mr. Munger does. So we have a pressure of 180 kilopascals and we have a mass. We know by now that we can turn any mass into moles by dividing it by its molar mass. The molar mass of ammonia is 17.03 grams per mole for 13.3 moles. Our gas constant is available on your reference sheet. It never changes. If it's in kilopascals, which is what we mostly work with, it's just 8.31. Our temperature is already in Kelvin, so we don't have to convert that. We just plug in our values on this uh, PV NRT, take our known side, divide by the unknown, and we get a volume of 160 liters. I probably should put an L there since I encourage everybody else to always identify your values. So let's take a look at the similar tank, but in this case, we're having changes happening in the volume, temperature, and pressure. The moles are not going to change. No moles, or in other words, no particles of the gas are leaving or entering the tank. We're just manipulating the pressure, temperature, and volume here. So we'll start off with sort of the same values that we had here. 226 grams of ammonia kept at 180 kilopascals in a 160 liter tank at 260 Kelvin. If the gas is transferred to a 200 liter tank kept at 250K, what is the new pressure? So once again, 226 grams is 13.3 moles. And the states that we had here on pressure, volume, and temperature are the same initially. But we are raising the volume from 160 to 200 liters. And we are um, dropping the temperature from 260 to 250. So probably we're going to have a change in pressure. So we set up the full uh, combined gas law equation, P1, V1, T1. We're searching for P2, V2, T2. It mirrors the form up here. We simply cross, multiply, and divide. So that tells us to multiply 180 times 160 times 250, and then divide by 200, divide by 260. And this should get us about 138 kilopascals. Notice that I'm rounding to um, three digits in the values here because pretty much all of our input values are in our three significant figures. So we tend to round to the same number, uh, especially if all the values have the same number of digits. Um, a couple of students have asked me about the non-significance of zeros. We're going to try to pr pretend that these are really precise figures and it's three significant figures. Toward the end of the quarter, we're going to get more into sig figs, but I don't want to get way too into it right now. At any rate, what the, in conclusion, our two main gas laws that we're looking at can be, can be viewed as one that looks exclusively at change, and the other one is takes in all four of the variables of pressure, volume, temperature, and the number of moles. There are occasions where these two sort of kind of getting mixed at times, and some of our future tutorial videos that we're going to be uh, looking at in the next few days will go into examples where it's possible to, eat, to have a set of conditions that are listed in a word problem, and either method could be used to solve for the value that we're looking for. There's other types of questions that that's, uh, force us to actually maybe take the ideal gas law, solve for that to get some moles, and then maybe have to plug in a combined gas law. That's where we're getting into the trickier stuff. You see these more in standardized tests. I'm not going to do a lot of those, probably more for enrichment. But anyway, I hope this is useful for you, especially as you're working through chapter 12. This is pretty much going to be our focus for most of next week. 
I'm looking for everybody to get these two structures down. Let's have a good weekend. Thank you.